Uh, I want to I want to teach you tonight a little bit on on what you're about to do. Not to convince you. I think you're already convinced. This is never. I just want to teach you on what we're about to take part of tonight. And I've called it God's return on investment. God's return on investment. The term return on investment indicates that there is an expectation that when an investment takes place, uh, the result of that investment is a return or an increase, a profit or a harvest. If you're in business, you'll know that your plan is to invest your money, your time, your gifts and talents. And as you do that, uh, you expect a return on that investment, a profit, an increase, a bonus. Uh, you expect more than what was invested. If you're an employee, it's the same principle. You invest your time, your gifts and talents, and you expect a return. At the end of the week, somebody's gonna pay you a wage, give you a salary, pay you a bonus or whatever it is. Nobody ever jumps into a business proposition with a no return. There's always an expectation on an investment of a return. Now, you, if somebody comes up and says, you know what, I've got this great, great investment. It's going to cost you $100,000 and I need to work one day a week. And you go, well, that sounds pretty good. Uh, what do I get from that? Well, nothing. So I work one day a week and I get absolutely nothing. That's right. And what happens to the $100,000 I invested? Well, you lose it. I can't think of anybody who's going to go, wow, what a great deal. Count me in. Now the concept of investment is a return on that investment that we build and we expect something to happen because we've invested. And the more you invest, let me tell you, the more you expect in return. And that's not wrong, that's how it should be. Even tonight, that when we bring our offering, our, our, our tithes and, and our faith, love, hope, I, I pray you're expecting a return. I pray that you're going, you know what, this is an investment, not just for myself, though it is that, but also for the Kingdom of God in a greater measure. I expect a return on what we do here. And it's not just a business principle, uh, it's a life principle. Uh, think about the year ahead. What return do you expect in your marriage, in your family, in your spiritual life, in your health, in your friendships? What you expect will really depend on what you're prepared to invest. Greater investment, then a greater return. Now we get to the point. Let me tell you that in all of history, no greater investment has been made than what God invested into His creation. There, there, there's nothing greater that has happened that, that been so much given, so much powerfully uh, uh, put into or given away by God. Listen, I wanna tell you tonight, God is driven. God has no choice in this. God is driven by His great love for humanity. He can't help Himself. A spider, man, if it builds a web and you knock that web down, it just builds another one. I don't care how many times you knock that web down, He's gonna build it. He is driven by the intuition to survive and He just keeps, God is driven by His love for humanity. He can't help Himself. He just can't help but give. In other words, to God, nothing is too much trouble for you and me. To God, nothing is too expensive for you and me. All that He has is ours, the Bible says. He's invested not just stuff, but all that He is into our world. And I believe because He's invested so much, He's looking for a great return. And tonight, let me just share the first thing that He invests. Number one is this, He doesn't invest just things, He invests flesh and blood in the form of Jesus. He invests the Son, the Holy Son of God into humanity. He invests uh, His holy blood, uh, that blood that, 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 that come out of Jesus' body wasn't the blood of man, it was the blood of God. God invested not just things, but Himself into His creation. Look at Romans chapter eight, verse 32. It says this, he who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with also freely give us all things? He did not spare His own Son. It wasn't too much trouble. It wasn't too much expense. He is, <laughs> he is driven for His love for humanity. You, me and all of the world. He, he pours Himself out. He, he wraps Himself in human form, the Bible says. He makes Himself a little lower than the angels. And He dies on a cross that that He created to take our punishment so that He can be in relationship with us, then to prove He's God and that death cannot hold Him down. The Bible says He is raised up from the dead again. There's an incredible investment God puts into humanity. Man, because of this, because of His blood, it gives us all another chance. It all gives us a future and a hope. It's no longer do we have to live lost, but we can live found. It's the blood of the Lamb that allows healing to take place because the blood of God has carried supernatural power. When we cry out for healing, it's because that blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. When we cry out for deliverance, it's because of the blood that was shed on that cross of Calvary. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. 
It says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, not natural things, not like silver or gold, but it was much higher than that, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He gave His very best. God invested Jesus that we may fail salvation, restoration and freedom. The reason you and I sit here tonight is because God so loved the world. He, he gave us all that He had. Let's turn to John. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world. Lo let's, no, 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 no. The planet, though He loves the planet, but God so loved us, humanity, He gave His only begotten Son, that's whoever believes in Him. Is there any whoever's here tonight? It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter what you've been through, how good or bad you've been. If you are a whoever and you can believe in Him, it says you will not perish, but have everlasting life. You don't have to wait to be a certain standard of person. You don't have to go through a certain program or an education thing. If you are a whoever and you start to believe upon Him, you are saved into salvation. Man, He has come not to perish, but to bring everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn you. He didn't, he didn't send His Son in to punish you. He didn't send His Son in to push you down or show you how bad you've been or what, uh, this is me. No, no, He bring His Son into the world that through Him we might be saved. He gave all, He gave His blood, He gave His Son, Jesus. He can't help Himself, He's driven by the great love He has for you, me and every person on the planet. Right here tonight. Maybe you've come and you can't say in your heart, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus. You might have come and, and out of an invitation, you might be here. You might have, have been in a place where you knew God, but somehow things got in the way and you slipped away from the things of God. And you, but you're here tonight and you're hearing this and it's speaking not to your head, but to your heart. And you know this truth and God has not come to punish you. It doesn't matter how bad you've been, where you've been. He, through Him, He wants to see salvation, your bread tonight. You can make a decision here tonight that would change not just something about your life, but everything. Hey, God is driven. <laughs> he, he's driven. He can't help it. He's so in love with you. He'll give you chance after chance after chance. He won't give up on you. He'll keep asking you. He'll keep being with you. He's for you tonight. Would you say yes to Him tonight? Would you say yes to Him? Would, maybe you say, you know what? I need to come back and recommit, reconnect tonight. Maybe this is your moment that changes everything. God so loved you. He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed would not perish, but would find everlasting life. He's not come to condemn or to nail you down, but through His Son that you may be saved and find purpose and reason and be healed and set free. Tonight, when we close our eyes and bow our heads right across this room, Father, we thank You that right now that we can make a decision that won't change something, but will change everything. And if you're here tonight and your head's bowed and your eyes are closed and in your heart, you're going, you know what? I need to make this decision. I, I need to come back to Jesus. I, I need, man, I need to believe. I am a whosoever. I, I can believe tonight and things can change in my life. I, there's answers here. I can, I can feel it. I know there's truth in this. I, I need this Jesus tonight. If you're like that tonight, if you're reaching out in your heart, we'd love to pray with you tonight. I'm not gonna embarrass you, but right where you're seated tonight, if that's you in your heart, say, you know what? I wanna make a decision to live for this Jesus because He loves me that much. I wanna come back and recommit my life to the King that I once followed, then this is your moment. With eyes closed and heads bowed, if that's you reaching out tonight, I'd love to pray with you. Would you give me a wave wherever you're seated tonight and say, you know what, pray with me. Thank you there, thank you over there. Just lift your hand, give me a wave right now. In the middle, down the front, down the front. Thank you in the middle there. Other, others, other people, just lift your hands wherever you're seated right now. Thank you at the back, that's a great decision. Others at the side there, great decision, sir. Quickly, at the back there, I see that hand, that hand over there as well, that hand to the side over there. Quickly, if that's you tonight, lift your hand, give me a wave. Thank you down the front. That's a great decision. Thank you at the side, young man. That's a great decision. Thank you at the back there. Come on, who else is there? And I know there's people right now. God is speaking to you. Yes, He is. Thank you, sir. What a great decision that is right now. Come on, others tonight, if that's you, slip your hands up wherever you see it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, this is your moment. This is for you. Thank you, young lady. That's a great decision right there. Others tonight, if that's you, quickly from the front to the back, I'm looking from the left to the right. I just so believe God is driven to reach out to you tonight. He loves you that much. He loves you that much. God, as I looked, I saw hands go right across the building. But it's not what you saw. You saw hearts open up. 
And that's the greatest miracle of, me, of, of, of salvation that can happen into a human being is that we find the truth and the reality of who you are and we start to believe upon you. We start to follow you. And God, your Word says that we shall be saved, not lost. We should have life eternal and life abundant. We'll give purpose and reason. There's answers now that are available to us that weren't a minute ago. We're going to follow you. We love you just as you love us. And we ask a blessing over all these people in the Name of Jesus. And all that agreed said, Amen. Give the Lord a great hand tonight. And celebrate all those great decisions right across the room. Listen to me, every one of you that lifted your hand or maybe you didn't, uh, but you're there in your heart reaching out to God. He's seen you, He knows you. He, he is driven to be a part of your world. He so wants to make the very best for you. And uh, we're so excited you said yes tonight. As a matter of fact, when we take up our faith, love and hope offering at the end of this, the whole reason we ask people to give generously, the whole reason we ask people to get involved is for the very thing that just happened right now, that people get saved, set free and delivered. Oh, that's our purpose, that's our reason. For all that we do, we don't build buildings to have a building. We build buildings so people can come and find Jesus, find salvation, find healing. That's what we do the whole thing for. So for those that made a decision, we're so glad that she said yes to Jesus. Give them another big hand. Welcome them to the family of God. And uh, in the pockets of all those that said yes, in the pockets in front of you, there's a I have decided to follow Jesus card. All right, it's orange. Can't miss it in there. And some pencils in there as well. We would love to help you on this journey because what you've done when you reached your hand up and opened your heart wasn't the end of something. It was the beginning of something. Great. And uh, we want to help you be all that you're called to be as a church. So if you fill those cards out, usually the containers go around and we get people to drop them in later with the offering. But because we're bringing them to the front, if you bring, fill those cards out now, but when we come to the front, just drop them in the, uh, the urns here, those big urns. We'll have some people be in touch with you about your next steps and what it means to be in the house of God. All right, so don't forget that. We're gonna see great things happen in your life in Jesus' Name. So God invests. He loves us so much, He invested His Son, Jesus. He invested His holy blood. And that would be enough, really. If, if, if that was God's giving, we'd say, you know what? We get it. You love us. You, you think we're amazing, but it doesn't stop there. And so the next thing He invests is His Holy Spirit. He, 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 he sends Christ to save us and then He sends the Holy Spirit to empower us. He, 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 can't stop, <laughs> he can't stop giving. He's driven. He invests His Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth, which is New Zealand, at the end of the earth. No, no, and that's not belittling, that's just Jerusalem, the far as you can go is the end of the earth to Jerusalem is New Zealand. If it was gonna be belittling, I'd say the end of the earth was New South Wales. That would be the end of the earth to me. In Jerusalem, but he says, I'll empower you. Jesus even himself said, It's better I go so the Holy Spirit may come. It's better I go. In other words, I, I'm here and what I bring is salvation. But what you need is something greater than that, not just for a town or a city, but for the whole world. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. So that you have this new life. Now that you have this fresh start, I will send the Holy Spirit who can empower you and enable you to live the life I want you to live. Again, God doesn't leave it all up to us. He says, well, now that you know me, good luck with that. Now that you've been saved, awesome. No, He says, now I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit. And as you receive Him, it will give you the empowerment to stand against darkness, the power to complete your mission, the power to have life and to have life more abundantly. He can't help Himself. He cannot help. He is driven by His great love for every one of us. He's driven not to leave us alone, but to see the very best happen. He invests the Holy Spirit. Now, it even gets more interesting. That would be enough. I mean, I can tell you love me, God. Look, you sent Jesus. You shed your blood. I, you send the Holy Spirit. Man, I, I, I can tell you love me. You know, I'm sure that's enough, but He doesn't even stop there. And this is where you and I start to get involved in God's plan and His picture. His love for people is so great 
that He invests the people that love Him back in the world to tell them. In other words, He invests His church back into this world. He says, now that you found out who I am, now that you realise the great love I have for you, now I, I love them so much out there, they need to know and I'm gonna send you back into the world. And this is how you and I get involved. It's not about just us, it's, it's, a, it's about what God calls the church. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptising them in the Name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. And lo, love that word lo, lo, and I am with you always even to the end of the age. Notice it says, go and make disciples of all nations. It does not say go and make decisions of all nations. And it's a very purposeful reason for this. A decision gets you to heaven. A disciple helps somebody else get to heaven. So when Jesus says, great that you got saved and that's awesome and heaven's an awesome place to be. But He says, then go and make not decisions, but disciples of all people. So our, our, our invest, God's investment now is it's His Son, it's His Holy Blood. And now it's the Holy Spirit. And as well as that, it's a holy people, His church. Now that you know, go on my behalf, be my light, be my voice, be my hands. Take me to your generation so they too will know the wonder that I am in the world today. So God loves humanity. He loves not just men, He loves everybody so much. He invests His church back into the generation they live in. I want you to see that. The reason that we're here is not just to have something, not just to get something. It's not just about you and me, though it is, but it's also about others getting to heaven as well. And once you realise that, your life starts to change. See, once you're, once you're a believer, your goal is no longer about getting to heaven. I want you to hear that. Let's think in a minute. Once you're a believer, your goal is no longer about getting to heaven. Why? Because heaven now becomes your destination. A result of being a believer is when you leave the planet, you go to heaven. So once you know Jesus, once you're living for Him, your goal is no longer about getting to heaven. Listen, the plan of God is once we know Him, once we find Him, once we embrace Him, it's not about getting to heaven, it's about bringing heaven to earth. Jesus said, pray like this, My kingdom come, My will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The plan of God is that we bring heaven to earth and the more of heaven we bring to earth, the more of earth is gonna go to heaven in Jesus' Name. That's why we're here. It's about the church being invested back in, about being light and salt and happy and having a good time tonight, Aaron. <laughs> about knowing who He is. About knowing the things that He's God. Listen, if it was all about getting to heaven, we'd just shoot all the new Christians. If that was the plan. If it was all just getting saved, praise God. All those people that put up their hands tonight, you know what we'll be saying tonight? So good. You know what? You're gonna meet God face to face in a few minutes. Our attendants over there, they have your blindfolds ready. We have the latest in machine guns outside the back there. It's set up in a few minutes. You'll feel nothing. You'll be straight to heaven. And we'd hear this. We'd all get excited, maybe stand up, sing a song about the blood. And, uh, you know, and be loving God, this is awesome, we're in revival. And, and our faith, love and hope offering, man, it wouldn't be to do programs or to help people in Africa or, or Cambodia or Red Frogs or in Brisbane. No, 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 we're in revival. Man, you need to give generously. We need ammunition for goodness sake. Because it's all about getting to heaven. But it's not that at all. It's not about just getting to heaven. It's about bringing heaven to earth. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, when you read this um, passage, what you think is the main Scripture is the first bit. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. And it is, that's a very powerful thing right there. There's a whole message on that. But to me, that's not the significant part of this verse. I believe the next part is, and we somehow skip over this easily because we don't see it quite as powerfully as the ambassador part, but it says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though, listen to this, as though God was pleading through us. So our ambassador role is not to make us big shots, it's to put ourselves in a position that God is able to plead through us to a generation around us. 
He says, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled. We implore those ones that are here tonight that don't you be reconciled to God. For he who made him knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That God says, I want you to be ambassadors. Why? That, that you can sense that I'm pleading through you to the generation around you that you find the wonder of Christ in you tonight. You see, God's plan is that He invests us back in to the world that we're a part of. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And He gave Himself, and He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for the equipping of the saints of the work of the ministry, for the edifying, listen, why? For the equipping of the, He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Now, why does He go to all that trouble if it's all about getting to heaven? If that's all there is to it, we just get saved and we go to heaven. He says, no, no, why do we, why do we have those positions? He says, because they are there for the equipping of the saints. Why? For the work of the ministry. All right, to be a part of what God's doing, to pray for healing on people, to set them free, to be a blessing, for the edifying of the body of Christ, that we teach people how to get along and do things together, and, and so the body becomes strong, and that we reach out to people, because it says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. So the part of the reason God puts apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists in place is to help the body of Christ be all that it's meant to be. There's a reason, otherwise we wouldn't need those things. We just come to church and say, get saved and it'll be all over. He says, no, and we are teaching and training and equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body and for the unity of the faith that we all get to know the Son of God to become a perfect man to the measure of status and the fullness of Christ. You see, our questions have got at some stage to get bigger than what do I get? Bigger than What's in it for me? And there's nothing wrong with those. Don't get me, man, you need to feel blessing over your life. If you're sick, you need healing. If you're not saved, you need salvation. So it's not wrong to think what's in it for me? Uh, or what do I get? I believe that's, that's the part of God's plan that He meets our needs. But never is it just about me. It's always about me and somebody else. It's always, it's always bigger than just who I am. See, God promises this, He shall meet all of my needs. He says, I don't have to pray for it, it's promised. God shall meet all of my needs according to His riches and glory. In other words, God's got this in place about meeting my needs. That's part of the package deal. What I want you not to worry about is so much in you, but what's gonna happen through you. The bigger question is spiritual maturity comes when you start to ask these questions. What difference am I making? What can I give? Really big question is this one. Who am I becoming? How can I get involved? You see, they're, they're, the, they're the sizable questions that, that we need to, that brings us to a place of us being invested back into our generation. Because yes, it's about us, but it's bigger than that. You know, I was a church and you remember a couple of years ago, I was going through cancer. They had uh, diagnosed cancer in my throat, uh, which, which blows me out to think that I get cancer in my throat when I'm a preacher. You know, like what a coincidence that is. Trying to, trying to stop me from speaking what God says to do. And in that place, they, they get me in treatment and uh, they start to burn my throat out with, with radiation. Uh, I had a tube in my stomach um, to get fed through because uh, it was a big syringe. And because uh, I couldn't get food in my throat, my throat was too burnt. And, uh, and my wife used to, I don't know what she put in there, honestly, who knows? But she was loving, it was always green. I'm so glad I couldn't taste it. And uh, you know, there's dinner. Whoa, there it is. Thank you. And, uh, uh, and I would feel it. Oh, there it is. And, and, and it was really, and it was a little lid on. <laughs> this is gross. Uh, a little lid on it. And I used to wear it under my shirt because it was, it was, in, it was in, stuck in my stomach from the inside out. And it was a tube and you have to puck, tuck it into your pants. Not many people knew. But every now and then the, the flap would get caught and would open up. And I'd feel this stuff on my foot. <laughs> and it was my stomach. I mean, oh, oh, oh look, it's, I'm leaking. And I put it back in. That's what happens. I remember getting in the car right here. Psh, what the heck? Oh my gosh, I'm leaking all over the place. It's green. <laughs> and uh, and then they give you a chemotherapy, and uh, chemo's poison. That's what it is. 
They should just call it, call it, they should just call it poison, really. They say, it's all gonna be okay. And they, they put, you, put a big inex- injection in your arm and, and they say, it's all gonna be good. And you look up and the bag's got a skull and crossbones on it. You know they're lying. And uh, it's poison, it's all this, keep it there, it's poison. It's poison you, poison you, poison you. He's almost dead, turn it off. Oh, thank you for that. All right, that's how it works. And the plan is the poison kills the tumour of the cancer and then your body has the strength to recover. That, that's how it works. And on my first day of needle in, da, 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 then they said, you know what? Uh, really bad news, we found a tumour on your lung as well. So long, long ago, have I just got cancer of the throat? They're saying there's cancer in my lung and, and really through my head. I just, I just couldn't believe the whole thing. And, and I said, what are you gonna do about it? And they said, nothing. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean nothing? They said, well, we started on your throat. And because of what we're burning your throat out, remember? And you're sick of the poison. I said, yeah, well, you can't, we can't do anything with your lung. And I said, well, what does that mean? They said, well, it's when you're strong and better, uh, we'll start to deal with it. I said, what happens in the meantime? They said, well, well let's just hope that it doesn't grow or spread. That was their plan. Let's just hope it doesn't grow or spread. And I don't know if you've been through stressful situations, but it's amazing how your mind can go through a thousand thoughts a second. And every two seconds, I'm believing God that all is well. And every other two seconds, I'm gonna die. Every time, praise God, oh, I'm gonna die. I mean, the whole time. And that, that would happen 25 times a minute. And, 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 and so I'm just going, all right, what's happening? And they finally, they finish this and they say, all right, let's do your lung. And uh, they, they do the big scan thing. And they said, you know, it's gone. It's totally gone. It's healed. It's totally, it's, it's nothing there. It's nothing there. It's gone. It's four or five months later. It was supposed to not, hopefully not spread or get bigger. And I told them that, that it wasn't what happened there. It was God did something miraculous. Let me tell you, as much as I know God loves me, and I believe that He wants the very best for me. And I believe He healed me, uh, that He loves me. But I wanna tell you, it was bigger than that. My healing wasn't just about my healing. It's now that I can bring a message of healing to other people. It wasn't just about me. And the amount of people that have come to our church and been prayed for for cancer, that have been healed of cancer, that have been saved because they've been going through uh, same things I've been through is because it's not just about me. It's not, it's not what do I get? It's not what do I know. It's that God wants to do something in us and then He wants to do something through us to the generation we live in. He loves everybody that much that He wants to invest back into humanity. Spiritual maturity is who am I becoming? What difference am I making? How can I give? How can I be involved? And these questions are really important to God. Don't take this lightly. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 through 12 says this. For God is not unjust. Listen to this. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labour of love, which you have shown towards His name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end that you do not become sluggish, but you imitate those through faith and patience who have inherited the promises. In other words, all the things that we do, our generosity, our being involved, doesn't go unnoticed to God. God is not unjust to forget your work of labour and love, which is shown towards His Name. See, none of us are too busy. We can't do something. None of us are so poor. We can't give anything and God would never ask us to do something we couldn't do. Nor would He ask us to give something we haven't got. But He'll always speak to our potential, our possibility, and get us involved because He's driven by His great love for humanity. And you know what, the truth is, if God had not invested His church, people of God, you and I probably wouldn't be in this house today. The reason so many of us got saved, so many of us found Jesus, is because somebody we knew started to tell us the story. Somebody reached into our life and this God invested His church, that you and I have the luxury right now of being born again, saved by His glory, knowing the wonder of who He is. God has invested everything. Invested everything. I mean, you know, I grew up not in a church home. I, I didn't know anything about church or God. And, and, uh, and it's funny, I was in Hawaii, I was surfing over there and uh, a friend of mine uh, who's a board shaper on the Gold Coast and he just got saved. He had red curly hair and freckles and uh, really good surfer, really good friend. And we were on this surf trip. I got there first. He comes in, he's got his board and his bag and he's jumping around singing songs I'd never heard. And, and I said, what's the matter with you? And he said, I've gotten saved. And I said, saved from what? And uh, and he said, I found Jesus. I said, was he lost? And, 
Uh, and we went through this whole rigmarole of I didn't know what he's talking about, but man, his life had changed. And, and that was the beginning of a seed that was put into my heart on that trip. And I remember how excited he was and how much things had changed in his life. And, and then he left. We, he was going on to South America. I was heading back to Australia and, and I said bye. And after he left, I realised he'd forgotten his Bible. It was quite a big one because back in the 80s, that's what you had was really big Bibles. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I, I said, oh, look, he's, man, he's forgotten his Bible, which I know now, now know was not the case. He left it there for me to pick up and, uh, and I stole it. He never got it back. Did you know the number one stolen book in the world to this day is still the Bible? It's stolen, it's the most stolen book on the planet. He never got that Bible back and he didn't leave it there by mistake. He put it there and said, God, I reckon he's prayed this, God, touch Mark, let him find truth in this. And I took that Bible back, I started to read it. It was the beginning. Listen, I am so glad that God invested His church back into my generation. And because somebody, now I'm a believer in the Christ that I love so much. God's invested all, He's invested His Son, His Holy Blood, His Holy Spirit, His Holy People, the church. Huge investment. I believe He's after maximum return, the most. And His return is all about people, their hearts towards Him, so He can bless them and heal them and give them life and life more abundantly. Multitudes and multitudes loving and living for Him and spending eternity in His presence. Fame and fortune doesn't impress God, but love and generosity does. The return of your investment today and through the years you're a part of this church is immeasurable, immeasurable. You can't put numbers on it. Personally, there's great benefit. Who you're becoming when you give, who you're becoming when you get involved, what you're receiving. The Bible says if you sow bountifully, then you also reap bountifully. There's a personal return on your investment, but there's a great return for others as well. Freedom from addictions, freedom from sex trafficking, people being fed, people being healed and saved and set free, marriages and families being restored, grace, mercy and love being poured out on a broken and dry planet. All because you and I decide to be the church and God allow, and allow God to invest us back into our generations.